Hello, listeners. I'm your host, Amara, and this is Black Girl Gone, a true crime podcast. On this episode of Black Girl Gone, we tell the story of Tiffany Johnson, a 25-year-old woman who disappeared from Euless, Texas on October 10th, 2016. Tiffany, who was originally from Iowa, moved to Texas with her twin brother in 2014. Eventually, she met and began dating a man named Chris. But after a few months, Tiffany ended their relationship. The day she went missing... Chris came to her apartment, and she went outside to talk to him, but Tiffany never returned to her apartment. Chris told her brother that she had gotten in the car with someone, and they drove off, but no one ever saw Tiffany again. Three years later, Chris was convicted of kidnapping, but seven years after she was last seen, Tiffany is still missing. What happened to Tiffany that night? This is Tiffany's story. The story of Tiffany's disappearance is a frustrating one for many reasons. There are many questions about what happened to her the night of October 10th, 2016. But the most important question, where is Tiffany, still has not been answered. And so even though there has been partial justice in this case, her family is still searching for her so they can bring her home. Now, unlike a lot of our stories, when Tiffany vanished in 2016, her story did make it to the mainstream media. And in the years following, multiple news outlets, bloggers, and podcasters have covered her story. I, however, was not familiar with Tiffany's story. I was actually tagged in a video on TikTok last week, and as soon as I read her story, I knew it was one that I wanted to cover. Seven years after Tiffany went missing, Her family is still trying to find her. The Facebook page that is dedicated to her is updated almost daily, and they, along with volunteers, are still organizing searches to look for her. The thing that I've learned from doing these stories is that in almost all of them, the most important thing for the family of a missing person is that they are not forgotten. No matter how long it's been, no matter how hopeless it may seem, They just want to find their missing loved one, and there is always a chance that they will be found, and that's why it's important to continue to highlight these stories. When Tiffany moved to Texas in 2014, there was no way for anyone to know that two years later, she would just disappear one night and never be seen again. Tiffany and her twin brother, Asher, were the youngest of four children, and Tiffany was the youngest twin. Growing up, her family said that she was a tomboy who learned to ride a bike at three years old and was skating by age four. Her family called her Tiff, or Pippi, and in an interview with Local Profile, which is a magazine out of Texas, her aunt Janelle said that Tiffany had a beautiful smile and an outgoing spirit. She had grown up in Iowa, but in 2014, she decided that she wanted to start a new life, and so she moved to Texas. Her twin brother, Asher, also moved to Texas, and so they got an apartment together. The apartment was in Euless, which is about 20 minutes north of Fort Worth. Tiffany got a job working for an insurance company and began settling into her new life in Texas. She had even begun dating someone, but in 2015, according to Local Profile, Tiffany found out from another young woman that they were both dating the same guy. And so they both broke up with him, but the two women developed somewhat of a friendship. And the woman ended up introducing Tiffany, who was now single, to her brother, Chris Ravel. The two hit it off, and not long after they met, they began dating. At first, according to those close to Tiffany, everything seemed fine between the couple. The couple spent a lot of time together in the early days of their relationship, and eventually, according to court documents, Tiffany began living with Chris, who was living with his mom. But 
It didn't take long for their relationship to change for the worse. Now, Chris was older than Tiffany, who was 24 when they met. He was in his 30s. And she had begun confiding in her mom that Chris was being controlling. According to Tiffany's mom, Deb Johnson, her daughter called her on several occasions to tell her about things that Chris was doing to her. Deb said that Tiffany would call her after she and Chris had gotten into arguments, and she said that most of the arguments started over something that Tiffany was wearing. According to Deb, Chris didn't want Tiffany wearing certain things, and he did not want her to wear makeup at all. Deb said that he wanted her to wear quote-unquote frumpy clothing. And Deb said that eventually... Tiffany just complied and began changing her appearance to please Chris. She stopped getting dressed up, stopped doing her hair as much, and when she asked her daughter why, she said it was because she didn't want other men looking at her. Now, After staying at his mom's house for a little while, in late May or early June 2016, according to Asher, Tiffany and Chris moved into the apartment with him. but. Even after moving in with her brother, Chris's alleged behavior towards Tiffany continued. Asher would later describe Chris as jealous, controlling, and aggressive, and that he would often make his sister cry. Tiffany, however, was herself growing tired of her relationship with Chris. She knew it wasn't healthy, and although for a few months Chris had had a hold on her, by August 2016, Tiffany was ready to end her relationship. She had not only confided in her mother about Chris's controlling ways, but she had also told her that he had grabbed her violently. Deb was worried about her daughter, and she had every reason to be. Right before Tiffany met Chris, he had been paroled after serving time for burglary with attempt to commit assault. He had a sketchy past, and if you couple that with the things that her daughter told her, She was concerned for Tiffany. Her Aunt Janelle came to visit Tiffany and Asher in August 2016, and during her visit, she got to meet Chris, who she said she didn't really like from the beginning. She recalled in her interview with Local Profile that Tiffany had been having car trouble, and when she asked Chris to come help her pick out a new car, he refused, opting to play video games instead. That among other things, left a bad taste in Janelle's mouth. So, a couple weeks later, when Tiffany texted her asking her how to break up with someone, she probably felt relieved. Now, Janelle said that she had never broken up with anyone, but she told her niece to tell him that she needed space. In an interview with the Dallas Observer, Janelle said that she told Tiffany, quote, you just tell them you need to breathe. You need time for yourself. By the end of August 2016, Tiffany had ended her relationship with Chris, and he moved back into his mom's house. But Chris was not ready to let go of Tiffany. He would text her, cursing her out, accusing her of breaking his heart, and saying that she had hurt him more than anyone ever could. But he also kept coming around. Apparently, Asher had developed somewhat of a friendship with Chris, and he would come over. Now, Asher's girlfriend, Jasmine, who had moved in after Chris moved out, according to court documents, said that Chris was coming over almost daily after the breakup. But Tiffany would do her best to avoid him. If she was home when he was there, she would just stay in her room to avoid having to encounter Chris. She was really ready to move on, even if he wasn't. And so although he kept coming over and kept texting her, Tiffany wasn't taking the bait. Asher said that when Chris was there, he would constantly ask him if Tiffany was seeing someone else or cheating on him, despite the fact that they were not together. By October 2016, it had been over a month since Tiffany had broken things off with Chris, and she was ready to see someone new. She had met a young man named Russell, and they had started talking. They weren't really dating yet, but they were getting to know each other. And so, on October 10th, 2016, Tiffany invited Russell over to her apartment so that she could cook dinner for him. 
Jasmine, Asher's girlfriend, also worked at the same insurance company that Tiffany did. And so on that day, the two left work together and went back to their apartment. According to Jasmine, after they got home, Tiffany changed out of her work clothes and got ready for Russell to come over. But not long after they got home, Jasmine said that they heard a knock on the door. It was Chris. He had come over with a six-pack of beer and some individual shots that he had gotten from the corner store. But both Tiffany and Jasmine were confused about why Chris was there. I mean, Tiffany was getting ready for Russell to come over, and the last thing that she wanted was for the two of them to be at the apartment at the same time. Now, according to court documents, after Chris arrived at the apartment with the beer and liquor, Tiffany and Jasmine confronted Asher about why Chris was there. And he said that he didn't know that Russell was coming over and that Chris had texted him earlier in the day about coming to watch the football game. But however he had gotten there didn't matter anymore because he was there and Tiffany wanted to make sure that he wasn't there when Russell arrived. Jasmine said that Tiffany had come up with a plan. She said that she was going to say that she was going to the store so that she could leave the apartment and then she was going to meet Russell at the local Walmart. Asher, however, said that he thought that she was just going to the gate of the apartment complex to meet Russell, but Tiffany wasn't able to go anywhere. Tiffany had been having car trouble for weeks, and her car had been leaking brake fluid. She had tried to get it fixed, but it was still giving her problems. Asher said that he and Chris were on the balcony of his apartment, and from there, they could see Tiffany get into her car. He said that she tried to pull out of the parking space, but when she did, that she could feel the brakes fail, and so she pulled back into the space. She then texted Asher to tell him that the brakes had failed, and he said that he could see from the balcony that there was a puddle of brake fluid on the ground. Asher responded to the text telling Tiffany that he had driven the car earlier that day and it had been fine, but... The car wasn't drivable, so Tiffany's plans to meet Russell before he got there were squashed. Now, Chris decided that he would go down to help Tiffany. According to Asher, he said that he decided to watch from the balcony just to make sure that everything was okay. But he said within minutes of Chris going down to the parking lot, the conversation between the two got loud. He couldn't hear exactly what they were saying, but... He could tell from his sister's hand movements that she was telling Chris to leave, but he wasn't leaving. After about 10 to 15 minutes of watching, Asher said that he went back into the apartment, and Tiffany and Chris continued their argument in the parking lot. Since Tiffany wasn't able to stop Russell from coming to the apartment, he arrived right in the middle of the argument. When he got to the apartment, He told Asher that he had tried to stop and talk to Tiffany, but he couldn't because she was talking to Chris. Asher said that he went back over to the window to see if he could hear Tiffany and Chris talking, but he said that they had moved out of sight and were now near the garage area. After several minutes outside, Chris came back to the apartment and gathered his shots and his six-pack of beer to leave. But Tiffany wasn't with him. Asher said that Chris introduced himself to Russell, and then he turned to him and said, quote, I should have known this all along. Asher said that he took that to mean that this was some kind of confirmation for Chris that Tiffany had been cheating on him. Chris, according to Asher, was visibly upset, and his overall vibe after he came back was just off. Asher asked him where Tiffany was, and what Chris told him made absolutely no sense. Chris said that she had gotten in the car with some mechanic and that they had drove off. But Asher hadn't seen anyone else in the parking lot near Tiffany's car. And when she left, she wasn't wearing shoes. So why would she just leave and not say anything? especially since Russell was already there waiting for her. After Chris left, Asher, Jasmine, and Russell immediately began calling Tiffany's phone, but she was not answering any of their communications. They knew immediately that something wasn't right. 
Tiffany was just outside talking to Chris, and now she was gone. And he was the last person to see her. When Asher and Russell go outside to look for Tiffany, what they find confirms that Chris was hiding something. On October 10th, 2016, 25-year-old Tiffany Johnson went missing after having an argument in the parking lot of her apartment building where she lived. Tiffany had recently broken up with her boyfriend, Chris, who she accused of abusive behavior. That day, she had invited a new guy over for dinner, but before he arrived, Chris showed up, and an argument began in the parking lot. After the two went out of sight, no one saw Tiffany again. When Chris returned to the apartment to get his things, he said Tiffany had left with a mechanic. But when her brother and her date go outside to find her, they find disturbing evidence that Chris was lying. After Chris left, Asher, Tiffany's brother, his girlfriend Jasmine, and Tiffany's date Russell called and texted her phone, but none of them had gotten a response. And so, after about 15 minutes, Asher and Russell decided to go and look for Tiffany. First, they went over to the area in the parking lot where Tiffany's car was. And on top of the car, on the driver's side roof, they found her car keys. The first clue that something was wrong, because why would Tiffany leave her keys on the roof if she was going with a mechanic? After finding the keys, Asher and Russell went to the other side of the building near the garages where Asher had heard Tiffany and Chris arguing after they moved from where the car was. As they got to the corner of the lot where the garage was located, Asher spotted Chris and his car. Asher said that Chris had backed his car up over the curb and was parked really on the grass. His trunk was open, and so was his front driver's side door and his rear driver's side door. Now, from where they were standing, they couldn't really see what Chris was doing, but Asher said that he could see that he was doing something in the trunk of the car. Asher said that they decided that they would go around to the other side of the building to see if they could get a better look at what Chris was doing. But... By the time they made their way back around to where the car was parked, Chris was leaving. And Asher said that he was speeding out of the parking lot. When Asher and Russell went over to where his car had been parked, they found Tiffany's cell phone and one of the socks that she had been wearing. They also found empty plastic shot glasses like the one Chris had brought with him to the apartment. As soon as he found his sister's phone, Asher started calling Chris, and he demanded that he come back to the apartment. He told him that, quote, this didn't look good. And Chris responded by saying that it seemed like Asher was accusing him of something. But Chris told Asher that he was going to make a U-turn at the corner and come back. He said that he'd be back in about five minutes. But Chris didn't come back in five minutes. Asher called him repeatedly, but Chris was not answering the phone. And finally, when he did answer the phone after several calls, Chris told Asher that he was on the interstate and had just been pulled over by the police, and so he needed to hang up. But at this point, Asher, Jasmine, and Russell knew something was very wrong. They found Tiffany's phone and her sock, and the last person to see her was acting funny. So they knew that it was time to call the police. Jasmine was the one who placed the 911 call, and police arrived on the scene about 15 minutes later at around 10.58 p.m. The officer who arrived spoke to the trio for about 30 minutes, and they told him about the events of that night. The officer then asked Asher to call Chris, and when he answered, 
The officer informed him that he was going to be listed as a suspect in a missing persons case, and so he needed to come back to the apartment to speak to him. Chris agreed to return to the apartment, but when the officer asked where Tiffany was, he said that he didn't know, and he said that when they finished talking, she was talking to some old man about getting her car fixed. Chris said that he was coming back, but the officer said that it was about another 40 minutes before he came back. And by the time he did, it had been about an hour and a half since he had first left the apartment complex. Asher said that when Chris came back, he was still wearing the same clothing, except for a white undershirt that he would normally wear. Officers, however, noticed that Chris was really sweaty which was weird since they said it was a cool October night. But Chris said that the heat in his car was causing him to sweat. Now, the officers continued to question Chris, and he told them that he had never made it back home because Asher had called him. Now, in an attempt to establish a timeline, the officer had called to see if Chris had actually been pulled over on the interstate, like Asher said. And he found out that Chris had lied. Now, this, along with other inconsistencies in his story, led police to believe that he was, in fact, a suspect. And so they read Chris his Miranda rights, and he was arrested that night. And when the officers were questioning him on the scene, they noted how unconcerned Chris seemed to be. He referred to Tiffany as, quote, that girl, and when asked what he could do to help find her, he had nothing to offer. The officer said that he was way more concerned about his car and being late for work. Chris was taken into custody that night, and the search for Tiffany began. Everyone close to her was sure that Chris had something to do with her disappearance. But with him in custody, it was now a race against time to find Tiffany. It didn't take long for the story of her disappearance to garner attention from both the local and national media. But the one person with answers denied that he knew anything. The morning after Tiffany went missing, a crime scene officer went over to Chris's mom's home where he lived to look for evidence. Now, they'd already been given permission to search his car. So when the officer searched the backyard of his mom's home, he wound up finding several items of clothing, including a black bra with a broken clasp and a camisole. He also found a white shirt that he said looked more like it had been used as a rag rather than worn as a shirt. He also found a silver bracelet and a broken smartwatch that matched the one that Chris was known to wear. Officers eventually brought in cadaver dogs to search Chris's mom's home and the wooded area behind it, but they were not able to find anything. His mom said that Tiffany would stay at their house and leave clothing, and she said that perhaps the dogs had carried it out to the backyard, but that was not a plausible explanation since she would have to let the dogs out to the backyard, and therefore she would have seen them carrying a bra. She said that she had no idea how the bracelet and smartwatch ended up in the yard, though. Investigators also pulled camera footage from local neighborhoods to see if they could see Chris's car near his home that night. And surveillance footage confirmed that a car fitting the description of Chris's car is seen heading towards his mother's house at around 10.06 p.m and then leaving in the opposite direction about 20 minutes later. His mom claimed that she had heard Chris come home that night, but that he never came in the house. Now, although they were having trouble finding physical evidence, the circumstantial evidence was mounting. Investigators had looked at other possible suspects, including two mechanics who had tried to help Tiffany. But... Both of them were clear to suspects. Everything they did have pointed to Chris. 
As attention grew around Tiffany's case and her family began searching for her themselves, there was another family that knew all too well what they were going through. Ten years before Tiffany disappeared, another woman who was in a relationship with Chris also vanished. Ta'aliba Islam met Chris in high school, and a little after they graduated, they reconnected and eventually they began dating. The couple dated for a couple of years, but there were allegations that Chris was abusive towards Ta'aliba. She eventually became pregnant with the couple's son, but Chris continued to abuse her. And in 2005, police were called to their home after he punched her in her stomach and her head when she was nine months pregnant. Ta'aliba tried to get away from Chris, but after their son was born, she wanted to make it work. The couple wasn't living together, but they were still in a relationship. On January 16, 2006, Ta'aliba went over to Chris's house so that she could spend time with their son. But something happened during that visit, and Chris became violent. His own sister witnessed it and said Chris punched Ta'aliba. She said that the punch was so hard that she thought that he had broken her jaw. That same day, a friend of Ta'aliba's received a call from her. And she said that she was whispering and asked her to come and pick her up from Chris's house. However, after that, no one ever saw Ta'aliba again. A week after she was last seen, her sister received a call from Chris telling her that Ta'aliba had not come back to pick up their son. Now, her family said that she would sometimes leave to blow off steam, but she would always come back. And she definitely would come back to get her son. But she never came back. 16 days after she was last seen, Chris filed a missing persons report. He told police that Ta'aliba had been at his house around 8 p.m. to drop off their son. And then he said she left in some unknown vehicle. Ta'aliba's story didn't get anywhere near as much attention as Tiffany's did. And with very little information and no leads, her case quickly went cold. But 10 years later, when Tiffany also went missing, interest in Ta'aliba's disappearance and her connection to Chris gained new attention. After his arrest on October 10th, Chris remained in police custody. By the time he would go to trial, the hope was that Tiffany would have been found. But despite the extensive searches, they still had not located her. Her family offered a reward that, by the time Chris went to trial, was $20,000. In August 2019, almost three years after she disappeared and a few days after Tiffany's 27th birthday, Chris went on trial for her kidnapping. His attorneys tried to argue the lack of physical evidence and attempted to have the case thrown out on a Brady violation. They said that there was no DNA matching Tiffany's in the trunk. The prosecution, however, painted a picture of an obsessed, controlling ex-boyfriend who was angry that she was moving on. They had witness testimony and they read Chris's text to the jury. The jury deliberated for two days, and on August 22, 2019, Chris Ravel was found guilty of aggravated kidnapping. During sentencing, members of Tiffany and Ta'aliba's family made victim impact statements. Chris was given a life sentence, but he will be eligible for parole in 2046. For both families, This conviction is bittersweet because their loved ones are still missing. In 2021, Chris appealed his conviction on the grounds that there was insufficient evidence to convict him. But I'm not sure where his appeal stands today. Tiffany's family has not given up trying to find her. And until they find a body, they will continue to search for her. 
they know that Chris knows more than he is saying. And while he's serving his life sentence, maybe he will eventually give them the answers that they deserve. When Tiffany met Chris, she thought he was a nice guy, but she learned quickly that he wasn't what he appeared to be, and she tried to get away from him. She tried to move on with her life, but Chris would not let her go. She once confided in her mom that during an argument, he told her that if he couldn't have her, no one could. And her family, as well as the investigators and prosecutors in this case, believed he followed through on that promise. Chris is serving time for the kidnapping, but investigators have to this day been unable to find enough physical evidence to link him to Tiffany's murder, if that is what happened, nor have they been able to find out exactly what he did with her when he left the apartment complex. In a recent interview in June 2022, Deb said that she believed that Tiffany could have possibly been sold into sex trafficking. She said that she just doesn't have that gut feeling yet that her daughter is no longer alive. Tiffany's family has been devastated by her disappearance. And even after seven years and a conviction, they are still reeling from their loss. The family of Ta'aliba Islam also holds out hope that they too will get answers. The families have become close due to their tragic common bond, and they are fighting to bring both women home. Tiffany was last seen on October 10th, 2016, in Euless, Texas. She is five foot four, and at the time she disappeared, weighed 135 pounds. Tiffany would be 32 years old now. Ta'aliba Islam was last seen on January 16th, 2006, in Fort Worth, Texas. She is 5 foot 11, and at the time that she disappeared, she weighed 130 pounds. If you have information about either of these cases, please contact the Fort Worth, Texas Police Department. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. It also helps our show grow. As always, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook.